Yeah, so um, I want to welcome you to to this webinar that um, I've been trying to organize for a while um, with Morden. And uh, it's because, uh, you know, I think when we started out on the Cafe Logic uh, Discord, it was just supposed to be a little bit fun and games. And then all of a sudden, we're like 300 and close to 350 people on the on the Discord, all of us having a, a cafe logic and made that kind of investment for for ourselves and, and probably gone through or, or going through the same journey that, that, that I did as well. And then being fortunate enough to, to know Morden from my early, early days, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm ha happy that we can, uh, we can set up this specific event also maybe to, to deal with some of the, um, the questions that I see often being asked, uh, asked on the on the forum, right? So, um, yeah, just as a let's say a small intro to where I know Morden from. Morden and I used to play in a band um, many many years ago. Morden was a drummer and I played the bass. Back then, we probably didn't drink just coffee, but <laughs> um, uh, yeah, we've known each other for many many years, and then um, I think we found each other through coffee and uh you know i have the pleasure of being able to always call up morden when i have a question and <laughs> that happens quite often <laughs> um so um to those of you who do not know morden um you know morden why don't you start off by talking a little bit about telling a little bit about yourself your background yeah. and also what coffee sure. mind is doing yes yeah and thank you for having me here and uh, uh yeah so i've been i've been training and teaching um, coffee roasters uh, since 2007. So I've been teaching more than 1,600 individuals in small groups of six to eight uh, in London School of Coffee primarily, but also here in Copenhagen. So, uh, and I've consulted a lot and I have my own business. So I've always been focused on helping people with creating a roasting business. And, uh, and, and for that reason, it's been really uh, both fun and fascinating to see Nikolai's learning journey because we started to uh, Nikolai lives in Dubai as you know and I, I started to get uh, uh, some business and more and more business in Dubai I think perhaps five six years ago or something like that and then of course we met up and uh, in the beginning um, Nico was not particularly interested in coffee but every time I visited, he got a new piece of equipment and uh, we started to talk more and more about it. And it's been fascinating to see the learning journey um, uh, because I, I'm not used to prosumers, uh, uh, to, to, to teach prosumers, but it's, it's very obvious that prosumers are uh, very eager to get the full story. So for me, it's, it's, it's interesting to see that whole segment, how, 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 learning and, uh, and and experimenting is, is uh, as uh, advanced as uh, professionals. And to be honest, sometimes <laughs> a bit more almost, it's often Nikolai telling me a new, about new gadgets and, uh, and uh, having a lot of fun with the espresso machine. I, I rarely have time for that because I've got millions of things because I have a business. So it's, it's uh, sometimes uh, uh, you can't have that much fun uh, so sometimes uh, if you have it as a hobby, um, you're actually in a pretty good position. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of the short version. Um, a little kind of special thing about Coffee Mind and my learning journey is that uh, I, I think I'll just uh, share this, start sharing the, the, the presentation by now. Um, just a second. Um, so, um, in 2014, you, you can see the, the screen now, right? Yes. Great. So I, I got some opportunities to get some of my samples tested from London School of Coffee. So the courses I did where I did different modulations and, hmm, uh, I've been teaching hundreds and hundreds of of students different things that I can kind of, my observations between the roast and, and flavor and and things that I've kind of convinced myself and my students for many many years all of a sudden people if if served blindly um, they didn't find it 
And I know that there's a lot of uh, trainers and educators that kind of has some claims and then they tell you to always taste blind, but it's never really done. I can tell you there's a lot of, because as a trainer, you don't really have time for that. It's not a research project. You're teaching people and you're so convinced that you don't even have to do it, really do it completely blind, collect the statistics and be open to you being wrong. I'm sorry, but few trainers have this kind of self-criticism and systematic way of, of, of really just roasting the coffee and give it to somebody else to even set up the whole thing and not talk to the students. When we do research projects, this, the, 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 the panelists don't even know what it is, but they, they can guess it's coffee, right? But they've got no idea if it's fertilization, if it's kind of uh, different species, if it's Ida's project was about different temperatures. So she served the coffees at different temperatures with control of plus minus one degree. And she didn't tell them what it was about. So they might have thought, well, she, she is really bad at controlling temperature because they're all over the place. But she wasn't. It was, that was the, and they scored the coffees differently. So um, I cannot stress enough how important it is to actually apply sensory science to everything we do because we haven't even started this yet in the, in the business uh, properly. We'll also come out with an article in a few weeks that we've been working on for six years now on how the whole organic acid thing doesn't make sense at all. There's no way people can identify individual organic acids in coffee, not even in water, only acetic acid in water because it's volatile. We did these tests and we are publishing it. So there's so, people are just so uh, kind of, focused on creating good stories and just run with them without really being self-critical. So we are the antidote of that. And that's, that's thanks to Ida's um, uh, background in sensory science. So we're doing our own sensory projects basically. And uh, before kind of Nikolai and I, we agreed that most of you have probably seen the webinars and, and, and so on I've done. So we'll actually do it primarily as a Q&A uh, this session. And then I'll pull up the slides that, that kind of um, uh, covers the subjects that we'll be talking about. But, but the first thing, to tell you what sensory science is, this single slide is, is really helpful. So sensory science was developed by Rosemary Pangborn uh, in the 70s at UC Davis um, in California. And Often when people talk about science, they stand on each other's shoulders to talk about molecules and chemistry and, and but only sometimes chemistry is relevant. So science is a lot of different disciplines and sensory science is a specific discipline with specific ways of uh, going about it. It's a very special method. And the method is, is, is really simple to explain. In, in a sensory project, you have kind of, three different phases in a very specific sequence. And, um, and there's a really good reason for the sequentiality of the way you ask questions and the corresponding methods to clarify the question. And um, in, in, a, in a sensory science project, you spend a lot of time mapping out intensity differences between samples. It's very expensive. The list price of a project to get just six samples, maximum six samples tested is 10,000 euros um, because it takes a lot of work by a lot of people. And maximum six samples is because we don't want the, uh, uh, the panelists to get palate fatigue. So they are not allowed to taste more than 18 cups in a day. So to create good data is very expensive, which, and, and right now I'm actually talking about the middle, uh, middle step here. It's the descriptive test. That's really uh, the core of it from a scientific uh, perspective. But before investing in that, before investing in that expensive step, it's important to know if people can taste the difference at all. 
because if they can't, if they can't tell the difference, there's no reason to move to the expensive step of describing the differences. And I cannot tell you how many industrial projects I've been in where people wanted to skip the first step and just go straight to the descriptive test because that's what they needed in the marketing material. And uh, we've kind of sometimes uh, given in, done it, and didn't find a difference. And then they are all pissed because they've wasted a lot of money not finding differences. And it's just, that's a risk, right? And remember, we did it particularly with one uh, company and they got really pissed and they said, then we'll just, uh, ah, well, it was a waste. And uh, they uh, went straight to the university and got the same test graded and they didn't find anything either. So don't underestimate the power of bias and, and uh, uh, in, in, in sensory. If you have a theory about a relationship, people will defend it and never test it. Um, and and, and uh, so that's why in a discriminative test, you will ask uh, the question, is there a difference at all? And um, you can see here, I've given a small example with light, medium and dark, um, just to make it really simple. It could be whatever. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a rose color intensity. It could be whatever. It could be development time modulation. It could be anything where you do an experiment, which means that you're doing it in one way and then you're doing it another way where one parameter is different. It's very important that you're only changing one parameter at the time between samples because you need to keep everything else equal. Because if you are testing more than two parameters, between samples, you don't know which parameter was driving the difference. And that's the whole point of an experiment. That is that you can identify the effect of one parameter at the time. So here you can see we've got a light, medium and dark. And I hope you agree that if we have a really light and a medium and a very dark coffee, it's easy to, to, to pick up the odd cup in a, in a triangle. So the probability of a random uh, outcome needs to be lower than 5%. That's the p-value is uh, lower than five. And if it is, you are comfortable going to the descriptive test because you have, you have uh, uh, demonstrated that there is a difference. Um, so that's kind of the first two steps. And I can tell you most of the theories out there about roasting uh, modulation wouldn't pass the discriminative test. Uh, and if they do, if people do a drum speed experiment, it could be low, medium, and high drum speed. And I see this all the time. People, they do an experiment and they claim they've found a, a, a relationship. But if you ask them, did you keep the color? Did you make sure that the color was the same on the three? Uh, no, 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 it wasn't a color experiment. Well, that wasn't what I asked about. I just. We've demonstrated that color is a, color, rose color intensity is a huge uh, factor of flavor modulation. So if you haven't made sure that the rose color intensity is the same, then you haven't designed your um, uh, experiment properly and you are making a wrong conclusion. So uh, most people are making wrong conclusions because they're they are not uh, keeping color the same uh, between experiments. And, um, and for those, those who, who, uh, who do, they making wrong conclusions because they are never really testing whether you can taste the difference or not. So that's the first thing. Um, so that every time some, sometimes somebody says something, it's very important to, to be critical and think, is this just a good story or is there really a difference? And then really test it uh, blindly like this uh, and make sure color is the same, right? Um, uh, and so that's the kind of now, now I've been talking about the discriminative and descriptive test. So you can see here if, if in the discriminative you find a p value lower than 0 0.05, all right, there's a difference. So we can, it's worth investing going to the descriptive test. And if it's light, medium, and dark, you'll see that the 12 panelists, they will consistently score the light one more acidic and the dark one less, less bitter. And the dark one will consistently be uh, scored higher in bitterness and lower in acidity. 
So this is how you describe the differences then. And the next step is the, the, the step that is always missing in the theories I see out there, because people kind of assume that there's one optimal and that some trainers are the keepers of the optimal and the guidelines that they have will give you optimal. It is such a confusing from a business point of view, but from a scientific point of view, it's directly violating the principles of sensory science where you would never ever accept nor assume any claims about an optimum. So it's, it's very unfortunate that, that uh, if, 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 if um, educators are kind of trying to paint people into a preference corner, just the curve looks, needs to look like this, trust me, right? If it's outside here, it's bad. And um, that's, that's, uh, that's really unfortunate because that's kind of taking the whole experimentation step out of your daily life, right? And also makes it impossible for you to address different customer segments with different preferences. So it's, 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 a, it's a direct violation of sensory science and it's a catastrophe for product development in diverse business settings. So can you see, I haven't said anything about chemistry here. This is distinction from sensory science and it's very wise to include that in education system. And we've done that in Coffee Mind by um, dividing the competency pillars of education into three steps. And they are not, they, they are, each step is preparing you for the next step. So we, I've created, and this is what's available in the Rose Profile Design Basic E-Learning for only 30 euros. You can get the process of uh, doing the first step, which is the control step. It's basically expo exposing the thermodynamics of your machine while keeping you out of extremes so you don't have to worry about roasting defects. So it's a bit like uh, learning how to drive. You don't go into traffic, right? You get into a confined uh, uh, road that's a bit arbitrarily built, but the point is not that you're going anywhere. You're going back to start, right? You're not going anywhere, but you're learning to drive your vehicle. And, and this is, so you need control. You need to have a very simple blueprint of what it means to control your machine. Once you have that, you can go to the experimentation states. And in the experimentation states, you are systematically changing one parameter at the time between samples. And then you yourself, is evaluating the intensity differences between the sample. Notice here, there's no preferences. The standard roast, the purpose of the standard roast in the control step is not the best roast. It's just not extreme. It's not very fast, it's not very slow, it's not very light, it's not very dark. But it's certainly not an optimum for anything. But the point of creating it is that you get to know the machine. And also here, there's no preferences. You don't assume preferences. You are you're just experimenting with a profile and then you are mapping out flavor intensity differences. So that's the experimentation step. And once you've done that, then you have the whole consumer relationship step, which is a different step, right? So uh, sharply keeping the preferences out of the equation until the last step where you are dealing with customers is, is really wise and uh, aligned with uh, sensory science. And, and I know this is a home roaster forum, but, but as a home roaster, it's all the same steps when you, when you want your competences because you also have different audiences. When your hipster friends uh, visit you on Saturday, you need the fruity stuff, right? And when your mother-in-law comes a Saturday morning, you need to serve something completely different. So you also have audiences. And you need to know how to deal with different audiences. So it's exactly the same. All right. I think, I think this was just what I planned to start with, just to, because it was uh, coffee science for home roasters. And, and this is what I would prefer to say as the first thing when it comes to roasting science, because it's essential to understand how sensory science impacts the way that we think about roasting education. That's cool, Morten. Um, you know, I have two clients. I have myself, which probably likes the fruity stuff, and then I have my wife, which thinks yeah. uh, 
A coffee that's, from Starbucks is probably the best in the world, right? As long as that's the ma business. main stakeholder stakeholders in the house. But you've also yes. got people visiting, right? And yes, then of course. it's something yeah, third, right? True, true, true. Yeah. Um, so, so what I've done. So first of all, uh, you know, questions you're more than welcome to ask them in the in the Q and A, and then we'll answer them uh, along the way. But what I've also done is that I went through the uh, the Discord, and then I picked out some of the questions and themes that I see happening again and again, and and maybe also giving some, you know, uh, uh, so that we can, we can get those answered with, uh, with Morten here. And, uh, you know, maybe one of the first ones that I would like to ask you, Morten, is that uh, we always talk about uh, flavor, and we talk about flavor and beans, and, and talk about flavor and coffee, of course, and, um, I know that you've done some sensory work on the origins of coffee and you know what you might be getting out of them, right? So what I mean by that, if you want something which is really fruity and, oh, sorry, if you want something which is which is really nutty and, uh, and, uh, and something that you want to roast really, really dark, maybe there's certain areas of the world that you want to look for a bean in. And, um, and if you want something which is more fruity and you want fruit forward, maybe there's other places in the world that you want to get a bean from. And um, and maybe we could cover a little bit about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I've I've done some really simple. Uh, yeah. So, well, uh, let yeah. Let's so let's start uh, with that. Yeah. I'll just find this slide. And, yeah. and um, another thing is that, of course, because we are using air roasters primarily, um, you know, we'll you know also talk a little bit about the differences between. Um, uh, roast systems, uh, of course. Yeah. So um, my whole point is that people often ask how to roast Ethiopia natural, how to roast Brazil pulp natural, how to roast Panamagasia, how to, as if there's one optimum, right? People want to get the best out of the beans, but that's also assuming one optimum. And that's a wrong assumption. And this is why, why I want people to start backwards and the start with a question, who would I like to please? And notice it could be yourself, which is fair. It could be yourself. It doesn't need, need to be others. And then, oh, okay, what, what do I want? What do I want Saturday morning? Well, I like to get started with uh, Brazil without too much acidity, just to get a really strong cup of coffee. All right, so that's me, who's the customer. And then from the customer, you derive a flavor profile, which is the intensities of the, the product. Once you have found your flavor profile, you can then select your green bean, and then you can choose basically which color, a, a roast color intensity to roast it at. And then you are pretty much 80% done with your product development just choosing green beans and roast uh, uh, degree. Um, and um, this makes it much easier to make a decision, right? Because you, you have some kind of, you have a purpose and then you have a sequence to, to design things uh, backwards from there. Um, so for example here, if, um, uh, so you have a flavor objective and then you, select your green beans. So if it's, for example, if you're developing a product where people add a lot of milk and they don't want to pay anything, well, you can decide not to create that product and not serve the customers. That's one option for sure. But you can also say, okay, I'll get that uh, customer. And then I can always teach him over the next five, 10 years and make money having a great relationship. That's also an option. But you shouldn't get the most expensive greens, right? Because they don't want to pay for it. Um, and uh, the flavor needs to be fruity and chocolatey, right? Uh, sorry, chocolatey and, and uh, perhaps even a very bitter. Um, and then you need to experiment. And now you that's the first most important decision. That's the green bean selection. Next step is uh, roast color intensity. And then the next step after that is development time. And that, that complies with our... Uh, scientific research where we have done systematic experiments with um, 
can see we've done a lot of experiments with the color development time and time to first crack across eight different research projects. We've been uh, mapping this out. And basically what we found was that, um, let's see, this is, the slide is not here for some reason. Uh, yeah, that color modulates 80% of the uh, uh, flavor uh, of a particular green. And then the development time modulates approximately 15% and time to first crack only five. And it's, it's not so strange actually, if you think about it, because the, the, the flavor development must be reflected in the amount of energy absorbed and the amount of energy absorbed shows up as the degree of brownness, right? And the degree of brownness changes much more in the end of the roast than in the beginning. So it's not so weird that the end has a bigger impact than the beginning, right? It's not so weird, actually. It's pretty common sense. Um, so that's why it's a good idea to start with deciding the, uh, the darkness of, of roast you want, and then uh, always take the biggest decision first, the next biggest, the next biggest, and so on. And, um, and this is where, for example, time to first crack, if people add milk, there's no reason to spend too much time experimenting with time to first crack because people can taste the difference anyway. And heat, heat source, airflow, drum speed and all that, it's typically not something that makes a difference that's worth uh, experimenting too much uh, with. So the whole point is that you need to kind of start with um, uh, in your product development, you need to have a specific flavor objective that's derived from the customer and select the greens. And I think this was the slide that you were talking about, Nikolai, where this is not an exhaustive. This is, this is just suggestions if you are if you are a beginner, this slide <laughs> is uh, useful because it's kind of rule of thumb basis, right? If you want something, um, if you want something um, uh, fruity, very fruity, you could take an Ethiopian washed. If you want something berry like blueberry, uh, black currant, and, and things like that, it could be Kenya. Geisha tends to be floral. Costa Rican, well, this is, you can get so many different coffees from uh, Costa Rica, for example, of course. So it's, it's just, just a very uh, kind of crude uh, rule of thumb. Uh, if, if, uh, if you have customers who really like leather, rubber, earthy, musty, <laughs> um, then for example, Robusta could be good. Well, some people enjoy this and I have a client in Paris, George Karam from Partisan. He's got a dark roasted espresso with Robusta for his local Lebanese community. And then he has some really light roasted um, hipster coffees as well. So he's got, a, he's got uh, all of it. So it's a completely legit uh, kind of product if you have a business strategy of collecting your local community. And uh, Brazil pot naturals are really good at, um, for example, in a, in a classical espresso blend. Um, if you've got, I don't know, 50, 60% uh, Brazilian pot naturals, it's, um, that's a good base. <laughs> and then you can add a bit of the mid range and treble um, using Nicaragua and Guatemala and Ethiopian beans. Um, so kind of this is really low, low practical uh, decisions, but it's important that you are making decisions stepwise backwards, right? Who would I like to address? What flavor profile could they possibly have, uh, prefer? Select your greens, select your, this way you're not kind of stuck in things that doesn't matter. And I see many people are really stuck in a lot of things that doesn't really move the needle and they, they don't have a stepwise process of progressing. They're just following curves without understanding why or without a specific objective uh, in the flavors. Yeah, um, yeah I think that, um, you know, also about tasting, that's also important, <laughs> right? That you, it, the graph, you cannot taste the graph, right? You can taste the coffee in the, in the, in the cup, right? Yeah, your customers don't drink your 
graph, they drink the coffee. Of course, the graph and, uh, and the coffee is related, but, but it's not the niceness of the graph. It's not the, the more pretty the graph is, the better it tastes. Why, why, why would there be that random relationship? Yeah, I think my own journey with the, you know, Cafe Logic, and I also know that many of the, of the people on the, on the forum here, or sorry, on the, on the webinar, have similar uh, experiences, right, was that we were very obsessed about making sure that when we, you know, the Cafe Logic has great controls, right, so it's kind of like, it's all, almost luring you into to focusing a lot on this, because you can control it uh, due to the control system, right. Uh, and uh, and the PAD controlled uh, roasting, but you also tend up uh, tend to end up focusing on on these small variations on the roast curve and thinking that well we have to make sure that we follow that specific roast curve and and it is actually you know personally I've stopped doing that completely. I just let the roast go along. Of course, I use the the controls of the cafe logic to decide okay approximately here I want my first crack approximately here. I want my my roast to end, but that's pretty much it. Whether there's small variations, you know, even at the beginning, right? That's only aesthetics on the curve, and and not necessarily something I can taste at least. Yeah, and I have a, an interesting slide to kind of comment the what does it take for people to be able to taste the difference? So um, you can see here, I have an Ikawa. I don't have a Cafe Logic, um, but they are the same. Uh, convection-based technology. So in the roasting professional, people are asked to be able to differentiate some extreme roast up against the reference in triangulation. And the extreme roast are derived from my research in roasting defects. Um, and you can see here, I regret a bit even talking about these uh, categories, I, as I should actually, I think, just talk about time to first crack, time after first crack. Uh, but in 2014, I wanted to try to substitute the American, I think, anecdotal uh, roasting defects curriculum with a more systematic. And then I tried to make some systematic differences and call them something. And uh, the scorched one for me was just the maximum heat output of the Ikawa. The Ikawa cannot roast any faster than this. But I keep the color the same. So this matches exactly the reference. It's exactly the same color but it's half the roast time, basically. And then there's the baked, um, which where I, so the scorch is just fast on both uh, faces, right? Where the baked is, is uh, slow after first crack and the underdeveloped is slow before first crack. So you can see I doubled the time, I doubled the development time of the baked and I doubled the time to first crack in the underdeveloped. And the question is, how well do they uh, perceive the differences? And notice here, the data I'm going to show you, these data are true because everybody wants to make perfect data here. And I want people to make perfect data because this is roasting professional. People have been roasting for years. They invest a lot. It's a really expensive course. It, it's 16, 100 euros just for the course and then flight and hotels and time off the job and it's really an investment and for me it's the most prestigious course right it's my my best students right so i don't want them to fail because if they fail they'll blame me right so we have all the incentives to get this right and we train I serve these coffees for them the day before. I serve them on the day to train them. And the question is, how well do they perform? So these data are based on uh, 35 students I've had. And uh, you can see here, there are two phase, two steps in the, in, the, um, uh, in the test. The first step is whether they can taste the difference at all. So that's a discriminative test, a triangle where they are served two references up against a scorched and in another triangle, it's two references up against a baked and so forth. So there are five triangles um, where they are asked to just find the odd cup. And when they found the odd cup, they are asked, and which one is it? So they, they need to also decide which one it is. And um, if you are forced to choose an odd cup in 
uh, in a triangle. Um, even if you can't taste any differences, you will choose, you will pick the right one by coincidence 33% of the times, right? Because you are forced to choose one. Um, and if you're going to select which one is, uh, which one it is out of five, that is a 20% chance of getting it right by accident, even if you can't taste the difference, right? So here you can see how they actually scored. So the discriminative test on the dark one with the dark cup was the odd cup, 100% was able to pick it out. That kind of proves how important uh, color is, right? The light one is a bit disappointing actually, but it becomes worse and worse and worse. And you can see here for the underdeveloped where the time to first crack is doubled. Time to first crack is four minutes in the reference and it's eight minutes in this one. And people basically almost fail. You can see it's only uh, almost 20% above uh, a random decision on the discriminative. And it's only 3% above a random decision in the identification. And it's a huge difference. And on, this, on the baked one, or scorched and baked, you can see it's also, it's disappointingly low, right? And this is roasting professionals, top uh, calibrated for this. So that this is just, this proves the point that Nikolai said with where people are obsessing about small things, but if they are really tested, nobody can taste the difference if the color intensity of the coffees are the same. And that's the trick, right? If it's not the same, if the color intensities of the samples are not the same, people will taste the difference. But if they don't control for differences, if they're not making sure that their different experiments ends up in the same color, they'll make a wrong conclusion that the drum speed or the airflow or whatever made the difference and not the color. So um, yeah, that, that's one thing. And, and also, yeah, I, I don't know if I should continue on that one or nobody I think, I think I'm curious makes... about some. Yeah, you, you know, you're more than welcome to, to uh, of course, uh, ask questions. So one of the other questions that's typically coming up on the forum, right, is what the difference between a drum roaster and an airbed roaster is. And, you know, I, I know that both you and also Tim Venable, when he was interviewed by you on your uh, podcast, you were talking about, you know, uh, your reference roasts on the on the Ikawa as an example, right? And it seems like you like a very fast roast over what we um, what what you see on a, on a drum roast. So most of the literature that's available today is focusing on drum roasters, right? So the profiles that you have there, they're like you know nine minutes and or seven minutes to first crack, and then a couple of minutes of development time and these things, but. A, first of all, how come is it that that different and, and, and is it just, can, can you compare them at all, right? Yeah, so um, the background for this standard roast is that it must almost be 10 years ago, Tim Venable was approached by a fertilization company to do a sensory analysis of different fertilization strategies. And uh, he contacted us to, for us to do that because it needed to be scientific. So Tim was involved and uh, he came to Copenhagen and we, um, and up until then I had done research roast on the Propatino being completely freaked out every time because it's, it's so stressful having expensive samples and then the responsibility of roasting everything the same every time in all aspects that that's pretty stressful on a old Propertino. So I really wanted to do it on the Ikawa, but I didn't want to make that decision myself. So Tim came and we did some different experiments between the uh, Ikawa and the Propertino. And we agreed from a sensory perspective that we got the most similar result when we had a six and a half minute roast on the Ikawa compared to a, um, a, 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 a Propertino roast. So um, 
And, that, and how long is a Propertino roast? If that's the standard roast on the Propertino is 12 minutes. So nine okay. minutes to first crack and three minute development time. And I and it still annoys me that I'm not able to explain theoretically why this is the case. But I can promise you this is annoying me so much that I'll I'll, I'll do something about it. There's uh, there's a um, I've got a new research geek friend called Mark Alcimeri, uh, and he is doing some crazy stuff. I'll just see if I can find. Um, uh, products, uh, literature, um, here we, rough craft, uh, just a second, I've got, yes, so you can see here is doing, he's doing research like this. Uh, so coffee bean particle motion in rotation drum measured using positron emission particle tracking. So, <laughs> you see, look at this. He's got a. Um, is, can I not zoom? Is, is it like one of those that you get put into if you want to do a brain scan? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's 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 something that can track. Um, you can see here. Is this is a, a mili uh, some kind of medical technique that can track uh, 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 particles. So they are taking some beans and soaking them in radioactive liquid, and then they huh. are drying them back to normal uh, moisture level, and then the beans are radioactive. And when they are, they can the behavior of the beans can be tracked. So you will end up with uh, with data like this. Uh, you can see here. As a CAT scanner. Look at this. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> so you can see where the beans are. Uh, are and, and he did a, uh, some experiments on airflow and drum speed here on how the beans uh, occupied the space differently. But he's also been working with on the Ikawa. So we, we are planning to do something together to, to understand why, uh, why there's this timing difference. Um, uh, yeah, the difference, uh, optimal time. And mm -hmm. uh, I, have, I have some theories, but it's not interesting before we've kind of proven it. So okay. just, but so we, we did this decision based on purely on tasting. Um, and recently we did some experiments again with with uh, with Ikawa and and Propertino and I actually I actually preferred the Ikawa roast so it's it's so it, there's really no limit to the quality you can do on a on a small roaster like this in, in my opinion okay what about the um, airflow settings on an airbed um okay. that's of course one of the big parameters right I, i've noticed myself that when i roast on my my cafe logic and if i have a relatively higher uh, a fan setting on it that it would actually impact you know the time to first crack on on that specific bean it um, would delay it in your case right correct yes but which one do you prefer from a flavor perspective but of course if you cannot keep the roast time the same you have a bit of a problem comparing it well right? if it's the same you know if it's the same roast level and i measure it on my I'm a, on my little roast vision, right? I, I would say it's it's probably insignificant, right? The difference is it's it's um it's a minor difference, right? Yeah. So when it comes to airflow, uh, I don't have any research that I can refer to, and so now we are moving into kind of my consultancy uh, identity, where I where I have preferences, and. Um, my preference is to have as, as much airflow as possible without slowing down the roast. So I've mm. been working on a lot of different roasters, um, actually recently on different pro bats, for example, where if you have a low airflow, you have a slow roast. And then when you increase the airflow, the, the roast speeds up. And at some point it starts to slow down again. And it's because if it's too slow, it doesn't have an efficient energy uh, transfer. But if it's too high, it cools down the system. 
So that's I, because I always, the air, the air is, not, is, is not in contact with the beam for long enough, right? Exactly. So I'm always trying to find that maximum because I prefer, and that's actually what we did on the uh, on the Probatino and the Ikawa, where we played around with the airflow. I have installed a frequency modulator on my Probatino. So we played around with airflow on the Probatino and the Ikawa, and we found the ones with the highest airflow to be the best yeah. from a purely personal. Now I said there's, there are no universal. <laughs> that's why I, this is my personal consultancy um, kind of um, uh, approach. But I tend to, when I find this optimum, I don't change it anymore. For, for me, it's more like how to install the machine so that we can okay. forget about airflow. So and, it's and not, for not me, it's different... not a flavor modulator. It's, it's just you, to you... kind of install. The and you wouldn't say that there's a major difference between different types of beans, like density and stuff like that. Uh, again, I I prefer to to leave that to personal experimentation. Um, but again, if I should answer this from a consultancy perspective, I seem to be able to keep really good speeds with high quality, uh, high density beans or high grown beans. But Brazilians. Uh, Always, oh, I've, I've just tried so many times as a consultant that the Brazilians, they need to be roasted a bit more gentle to not taste burnt. Okay. And for me, that could be a combination of, it could be either, depending on the brand of roaster, of course, and the technology, but, you, but it could be if I'm running full flame in the beginning on a Kenyan or a, 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 any Colombian washed uh, high grown bean. I might only go to maximum flame 90 or 80 uh, if it's a Brazilian coffee, mm. because otherwise I have my personal experiences that they start to taste burnt. Okay. But that, that's actually it. And, and I would love to go more into more research where I could perhaps create some more helpful models for how to relate different bean size and density, but Everybody yeah. talks about density, but I haven't seen any theory connecting anything, really. It's just a lot of opinions. But I'm not too concerned about that because in our, in our model, I'm telling people to do experiments themselves. We're really educating people to do their own experiments uh, and, and do their, train their skills to do their own evaluation. So you don't need a grand theory, a, a kind of this is the theory between density and 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 uh, flavor you don't need that theory to create a good product you can do a few experiments and just pick the best one and you don't need to be able to explain everything but you need to be able to know how to do experiment and you need to know how to do your to trust your own sensory evaluation so we would much rather that people develop their skills in experimentation and skills in evaluation and not try to explain everything uh, theoretically, but just kind of do it some experiments and pick the best one and kind of <laughs> get over it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So what I hear is that air beds, it's not as long as roast uh, along a, a, a roast as when you when you see on a drum roaster. Huh? And um, what about you know we talked a little bit about defects and are they should you worry as much about roast defects? In an in an in an airbed compared to a drum roaster, is it almost, you know, you talked about the Brazilians talk, uh, you know, uh, tasting uh, burnt or, or or too roasted, but in an airbed, it's a very different heat transfer system. Yeah, I'm I'm not too worried about all that because it's um, I'm always trying to stay out of the extremes and kind of push it from the safe center. And, and that's where I've kind of developed the standard roast um, that, I, that I told you about. And, um, and this is my standard roast on the Ikawa where I'm trying to keep out of the extremes, which means starting at pretty low temperatures in the beginning and then uh, going up pretty steep. Um, uh, I don't wanna replicate the artifact of starting high as in a drum roaster. I'll just, with the fewest possible assumptions, I, I, I'll always work out of the fewest possible assumptions. And that is to kind of start low and then take it up. And then another thing, and that's something we've talked about 
Nicola, you said that on the on the on the forum that people are talk, discussing a lot. When does first crack start? And um, for me, it's not it's not that important because the important thing for me is to and that's a bit weird for somebody who focus so much about develop, uh, on development time like, that I do. Um, but the important thing is that you are able to do experiments. And experiments means that you are doing different samples with different development time. And that's why on the Ikawa roast, I've created this standard roast where I have this point at four minutes and 200 degrees. And I have another point at five minutes at 205. And all the beans I've been working with has always cracked bet between these two, um, between these two points. So I don't really care about the first crack. I don't even lock it because what I do is I'll do different variations. So if I have a particular green, I'll do different variations, putting this single point different places. Um, so I have this framework where I'm where you can systematically work with color and development time. So that's what I do. I'll explore the combination of color and development time for that particular coffee. And I'll pick the one that matches the flavor goal I have for the project. And I don't care if it cracked at 202 or 204 because it doesn't, it doesn't affect the purpose of what I'm doing. Because the purpose is to design a specific flavor that I have chosen from from strategic reasons so which kind, so that which kind of yeah. leads a little bit to the next question that i wanted to ask you when you have a new green bean and by the way you know you talk about customers right we probably home roasters we, we we don't care too much about customers right we we care about what we like ourselves right and then but you're your own have, customer yeah yeah it's sure the, but yeah but my, my so when you get this this new green bean, we're always trying to kind of hone in and figure out what is the best way of roasting this specific green bean. How would you go about, let's say, dialing in a green bean? Would it simply be something as simple as saying, you know what, this one I'm going to roast to uh, Actron uh, 100, and I'm going to do a rec Actron 90, I'm going to do an Actron 80, and then I'm going to do copying against them, and then I'm going to say, you know what, this one I really like, and, you know, I'm going to use this for filter, so... I like it like this, or this one I'm going to use to cut through the milk on the on the Saturday morning cappuccino. Uh, so I'm going to keep it at the at the darker roast. Is, is, is it as simple as that? Yeah, but I would still, uh, even if you're a home roaster, I would still, you don't just end up with a green, right? And it, you will pick some greens with a purpose, because even mm. if you're your own customer, you will, there's something that you're looking for, right? Mm-hmm. And then, then I think it, it's a good idea to be specific about what it is that you're looking for before just kind of Fine. Uh, to kind of get that discipline of, well, don't just pick something. Happy. So what is it that you want to create? Uh, it could be that you want to create something that you tasted last time you were in London or Copenhagen, or I really like that one, or at World of yeah. Coffee exhibitions. You, so, so be specific about the flavor profile you are chasing. Because if you just get some coffee, there is no shoots, right? And yep, the coffee right. will not tell you what you should do, right? Of course, you can play around, but that's um, yeah. So um, yeah. So I think even as a home roast, it's a good idea to 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 be more conscious about that you are actually trying to create something and then be more specific about what it is that you are trying to create. Because if you are not, you tend up end up, uh, to end up in these, oh, it should be, the curve should look like this, or is it a defect? All these questions that it leads you astray. So if you think, okay, I want to create, as you said, I, I want to create my perfect cappuccino coffee. And then the next question is, what do I think is a perfect cappuccino coffee? Yeah. Is it really deep chocolate or would I like a blueberry milkshake flavor or whatever? And then go try to find the coffees. And, and that's another thing. If you, if you just, it's a really a good idea to go and cup the coffees before you buy them because what's written on the bags, it's so random. 
So mm-hmm. sometimes if, if people get uh, some coffees that it says plum pudding, right? And you roast it and, oh, I don't get plum pudding. I must be do- doing something wrong. No, 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 no. You just don't have the same vocabulary as, as the marketing uh, person who loves fancy words, right? So, so it would be a good idea to go and do the cuppings yourself. And uh, you can do that in, in Dubai, right? Nikolai Seifer, for yeah. example, you can go yeah. and, and uh, taste uh, coffees all the time. And many, many of the green bean uh, suppliers here, you can actually, they would, they would gladly set up a cupping session for you. I, I don't think every, everyone has the same, let's call it luxury of being able to do that, but, but that's what we do, right? Yeah. Um, because if I had a coffee, I would even my, and that's what I always teach people in, uh, on the courses that, I would, I would, um, I don't have a standard uh, kind of sample uh, roast. I would, if I'm, if I'm looking for a kind of light roasted fruit forward coffee, I would perhaps do a few variations in the lower left part here because that's where I find my fruity flavors, right? Why would I roast a coffee dark if I'm looking for something mm-hmm. fruity? And if you are looking for something to really be chocolatey for your wife in the cappuccino. Of course, you you are exploring the beans in the upper right corner where you will find the darker roasts and you can play around with different development times. But and, and this is my point. You need to be looking for something. Mm. You shouldn't be you shouldn't be looking for what the beans tell you. They don't tell you anything. You have a plan. Right. And and, and that I think that that's important. Yeah, that's cool. There's actually a question. Would be interesting to see how timings go on the road rust coffee roaster. I'm actually invited uh, to do a session in uh, with them uh, in the fall semester. We've talked about doing a a session. So uh, because that that's true, that's more like a drum roaster type. Um, so um, that's interesting. Um, yeah, so I agree. It's interesting, but I haven't I haven't roasted on it yet, unfortunately. Um, so hopefully, I'll I'll be able to to give you some more insights uh, in a few months. Good. Well, I'm just a little bit worried about time because uh, you know we might go we we set it up for an hour, right? But if some of you are interested in going on, we can also. I know you have a little bit more time, more than I also have some time. Um, but I just want to cover a few more things. So. DTR, that's a concept that's being discussed a lot on the on the site, right? And, uh, you know, I know that you have pretty strong feelings about DTR. Uh, even on the Cafe Logic, it even calculates the DTR. If you go in and mark first crack on the roaster while we roast, then it will actually showcase what is your DTR. It will count up as, depending on how long the roast is ongoing. Um, so, yeah, if you can, is that a good... It is, and actually, Nikolai, it's uh, I, I I created a slide a few hours ago because you you uh, anticipated this question for me in the in the email you sent, and uh, I I thought about uh, how to explain it in a simple way <clears throat> because there's a there's a principle in theory of science called Occam's razor, which is if you have two theories or two explanations that explains the same choose the simpler one and that that's really the essence of what I, what i think is misleading in the development time ratio or the rate of rise uh, obsession is that it's it's not it's not that it's necessarily is directly wrong it's just overcomplicating things so it, it it's pretty confusing so i created this slide uh, and I want to run it um, just a second. Um, so if you look at so now you see this, right? How does it... And by the way, guys, everyone who's on the call, if you if you have questions, right, just feel free to ask them in the Q and A session and uh, or Q and A section. So um, you all know that uh, uh, many years ago, people thought that the Earth was in the center of the universe and everything evolved around it. That's what 
that's called what's called the geocentric uh, model of the solar system. Is and that then that's true. <laughs> <laughs> and then well, it's not that it's wrong, and that's this exam exactly here. You can assume it, right? And then you can also, but you can also assume that the uh, the uh, the the sun is the center, and in both scenarios, you can make very pre precise mathematical models for how the uh, everything will behave. So none of the theories are wrong, but the difference you can see here, if you assume that the sun is the center, then you will get the model on the left. And if you assume that the earth is, is in the center, then you get the mathemat mathematical model to the right. Both of the models can explain where the uh, where you will see the different uh, objects in the sky. Which one would you prefer? Yeah, the, 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 the left one, of course, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So my point is a theory doesn't necessarily need to be wrong to be a bad theory. So I've taken some further. You can see here, if this keeps on going, you can, you can already see here, it looks like a mess, right? And this is when it's been going full circle. So the point is, beware of overcomplicated theories, not because they are wrong, but because it confuses you. And conf a confused mind makes worse and fewer decisions. So, but for if example, an example rate, rate of rise is, is very relevant to identify, if you know that you want to stop your roast at a certain point, rate of rise is relevant, right? Well, it, rate of rise is the speed of the curve at any given moment, which is just mm. the same as the speed of the car you see on your speedometer. So it's not wrong, but it's only relevant in some contexts. And remember that in sensory science, you are very, very reluctant to mix technicalities with preferences. Because why would you assume that there's one technical configuration that satisfies all? It's just a, 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 it's not a good assumption, simply from a product development perspective to assume that there's an optimum. So that's the rate of rise theory. There's a lot of things that makes it a bad theory, but, but that, that, that's one of the things that it violates the idea of one optimum mm -hmm. uh, or, or that there, there isn't one optimum. Uh, but the development time, it, so the point is a theory needs to be specific in what it predicts. And better is not specific. And it's, again, violating sensory science. There's not one thing that's better. Give us some relationships, right? A good theory gives us relationships um, between input and output parameters. Um, and such as just a line, right? If X becomes higher, Y becomes higher with this slope, right? It could be, for example, bitterness goes up, right? And acidity goes down. So it's specific. The input parameter specific could be time, could be a rose color intensity. And then it's also specific what happens. So that's a good theory because there's no question about what the input is and what the output is. Um, so, and, and also a good theory is established on uh, kind of concepts uh, or uh, mechanisms well known in science, such as the ideal gas law or the speed of chemical reactions. And here the rate of rise is not, it's, it's not, what is it? What is the fundamental process that we are trying to estimate that would explain that it's better? It's just not really clear. But that's also specifically from the perspective of keeping an even rate of rise uh, or it's not necessarily that rate of rise is something that it's good from the perspective of saying, okay, I want to end my roast here. So that's why my speed of my roast is this right now. So I know what my, what's my temperature going to be in 
two minutes from now and when am I going to end the roast and these things. That's, that's where it's relevant, but it's not necessary exactly. that we need to be obsessed about that it's even or that it's, uh, you know, there's certain theories that you're, that's being followed, right? Yeah, and, and that's one thing. Why would you assume that there's one shape that's better, right? That's one thing. Another thing is that you're tra trying, you're tending to overemphasize something that's really small. If you, because the rate of rise is just the shape of this curve. There's a lot of noise on it because the software kind of struggled to make a precise, smooth uh, calculations on, on the go. Um, and that's why it looks so uh, kind of noisy. But also the big fluctuations is just a magnification. It's like putting a magnifying glass on a small spider. It doesn't make the spider more uh, dangerous because the rate of rise is just the shape of this curve already. And you can see that it's really hardly any fluctuations you can even see, right? But if you put a magnifying glass, you can see it. But that's not making the problem bigger just because you magnify it. The real problem is not a problem because the real phenomena is small, right? So it's also misleading to look at it because it looks like something is going wild, but it isn't really. It's just a small thing that you magnify. That's cool. Um, you talk about discriminative, what, what did you call it? Discriminative testing? Yeah, discriminative test and descriptive yeah. test. Yeah, exactly. And so one of, one, one of the things we did in my summer house this year was that I rehydrated some coffee beans. And so, I think, you know, not saying that you and I were a good representation of a panel, <laughs> but it was quite interesting to see that there was actually a difference between the hydrated and non-hydrated bean. Do, do you have an idea why? Um, well, moisture has a huge impact on the actual roasting process. So first of all, it kind of protects the surface from overheating. And it's a medium that is very efficient in conducting heat from surface to center. And it's also the pressure source leading to first crack and yes. also leading to a, a, an expansion uh, of the material. So the more moist it is, theoretically, it should expand more, which should increase the TDS. If you even if you keep the color the same, it has expanded more, and that makes the the grounds more permeable, and uh, it's easier to take uh, take out the the um, uh, all the solubles. Um, so it's 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 uh, it's really interesting to to uh, experiment with, um, but again, it's interesting to do even regardless if we shouldn't look for better or worse, we should be looking for how does, from an intensity perspective, how does it change the flavor? Um, because that's interesting. That's the first question. Don't, we shouldn't look for preferences as the first thing, right? That, that's not the, as, as you remember from, let's see if I can find that slide again, right? It's, it's not that you shouldn't be looking for preferences as the first thing. First, you should be looking for differences. And that we did that in the summer house, right? And we did find differences. The next question is, how are they different? Not from a preference point of view, but just pure intensity. So more or less acidic, more or less bitter, more or less whatever. And then later, you can always kind of, um, because it might be that you have an audience, you can see here in my model of, I should have it somewhere. Um, no, I don't. Um, so it might be that, let's say, let's assume, it, it could be that it tastes better, right? That's great, then the hipster segment might prefer it. It could also be that it, it actually doesn't taste better. It only tastes a bit different, but you've saved all the um, uh, kind of the, the, uh, the diesel uh, on, the uh, on, the, on the ship, so you're saving a lot on, um, on fuel. Um, and then these people, they can't taste the difference anyway, but you've saved, uh, you, you, you have a lower CO2 uh, footprint uh, on your production. So there's a lot of possible benefits mm. uh, depending on how the experiment turns out. But of course, as coffee quality people, we are interested in how does it change it at all? Yeah, yeah okay. I know that uh, Benjamin, who's, Who's also on the on the call here? He's spending a lot of time. He's all he's always rehydrating all of the beans, and that's you know I do the same because I, you know, 
I know that we shouldn't talk about preference, but I've never had a bean tasting worse by, you know, not hydrating it, right? So at yeah. least from, and now today it's just become a standard for me, right? It's just literally something I measure, leave them the day before, and then uh, and it goes on there. Good. There's a few uh, questions coming in. So uh, so first of all, Dennis is raising it. If moisture is protecting the surface of the beans from overheating, maybe that is a theory reason why shorter rows and air rows are superior. Yes. Yeah, so under the assumption that an air roaster is uh, uh, drying it faster, right? Mm. That's actually a, uh, yeah, a, a good hypothesis because I I remember I measured uh, the the airflow in an Ikawa once because I wanted to ex experiment with with um, with oxygen free roasting and I had to calculate how many uh, liters or kilos of nitrogen I needed. You had to pump into the machine. <laughs> yeah, I had to I had to to uh, budget one thousand euros. Uh, for just for the amount of nitrogen needed for the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> Did you do the experiment at the end? No, because I kind of, we tried, it was actually for lowering because they, they have zero oxygen. So we wanted to experiment, what's the difference? And I thought if I put in a, a lot of nitrogen in an, in an Ikawa and we measured below 1% of oxygen um, in the setup. So it would work, but we got busy with other stuff and, Loring didn't okay. exactly understand it. So, but I think it was 300 liters per minute in this small roaster. So, so uh, yeah, it's very, there's a lot of air going through these things, right? Yeah, yeah. So, I actually, Dennis, I, I think that's a pretty good uh, hypothesis. Um, yeah. But maybe something you'll be testing more in the future. Yeah, if it was to, uh, I need, to, we need to get Edith's PhD done. Uh, we'll get her first article out soon. And perhaps in a year or two, I I, I might be able, to... be able to 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 get my own, and then we could have spent the days uh, getting all these things uh, tested. It could be great fun. Yes. I can also see Benjamin. He uh, he asked a question. So I have a question regarding the whole RR discussion. I've heard you say a couple of times that aiming for a specific trajectory or shape of the ROR curve, specifically a smooth decline, leads to improvisation with gas settings and whatnot. I would say that's an assumption, but I'm curious if you encountered it. Yeah, I I agree, Benjamin, that it's an assumption, and and it's but it's just something I've seen a lot, um, because if people are insecure, they tend to grab somebody else's uh, kind of curves and try to follow them, and if they are told uh, the whole uh, the constant declining rate of rise, how could they not improvise, right? How how would it be uh, kind of smooth if they don't improvise. But you're probably right that you could make a plan on your flames because you've done the experiments a lot of time and then you know exactly where to put the flame. So I, I, I'll, I'll give you that one, uh, Benjamin, that, that's an assumption. But in reality, that's what I see people are doing. So that's why I think the assumption is not taking out of the blue. Mm. But it, it, but I agree that there might be cases where this is not the case because people simply know how the machine works. So they already have a flame plan and if they follow it, they don't need to improvise and they'll get a smooth rate of rise. So yes, but it, it it's just, I've been teaching, yeah, as I said, 1600 people in small groups. So the reason why I'm pretty strong about this is that and I also say this in the, in the beginning of the blog post, there, there are things that I need to say so many times before we can get to the interesting stuff that I really kind of needed to start to speak out about this to hopefully start a different place in, in a year or so um, with education uh, where people, for example, know that they shouldn't be uh, improvising with the gas all the time. They should actually, and that's the whole point of my control uh, step before the experimentation step in our teaching framework is that um, we teach people to control the roaster so they don't have to improvise uh, during with, the roast. With, with the cafe logic, the PID system kind of takes care of all of that. Yeah, yeah that's so not a big it, problem it, for you. <laughs> it's, it, it's quite easy, but you know, maybe to some extent, it, it's a little bit like when we see that the roast is not, oh, sorry, that the roast is not following the roast curve, where we start to play with these power 
power profiles and uh, and boost zones and all of what what is called this is all capabilities we have on the roster right but yeah. maybe it's not actually the right thing to do i i don't know um i i personally i don't do it anymore but also because i'm just a little bit lazy right um so okay um i can also see we have one from bart to clarify a bean that expands more is more soluble uh, and per your roasting foundation ebook okay the shorter the roast the more bean expansion so if i cup but i don't measure tds of cupping bowl then shorter roast could extract more and could introduce a confounder variable uh per, per oh, is, if people refer to my own book uh, you should know what you've written on. <laughs> uh don't miss it so so if i cup but don't measure the cds of board the short road should extract more uh and that could be introduce a confounder no it's not a confounder it's just a consequence and i i just found we we've actually measured this so you can see here so it's pretty trivial that if you roast darker, you get a higher TDS, right? That that's also more, almost like the chemistry that it becomes more soluble the darker it becomes. But it's a bit surprising, perhaps, that the faster you roast, you get a, a higher expansion. Uh, actually, you can see you can see here. So the faster you roast, the more the beans are expanding. So you can see the the longer the development time. This is only the development time. A longer development time is less expanded compared to a roast with a shorter development time at the same color. And the shorter development time has a higher TDS. And we interpret that as higher expansion. Expansion. It's more spongious, and therefore you have bigger channels. And this is. This is our data, but this is also well established in the scientific literature that if you roast faster, you'll get a higher TDS. Um, but your question, so so if I cup but don't measure TDS of cupping ball, then a shorter roast could extract more and that could introduce a confounder variable. It's That's a really interesting question because um, for me, it's not a confounder, but a consequence. So, but it, but it really depends on how you want to see it as an experiential setup, because I would say that it's a feature of the product, right? So if you prefer a certain cup, it might have to do with the higher expansion, but if you send it to the market and your customers has, they don't compensate, right? They'll just chug it in the same, process um then they will also exp experience the superiority of that cup on that parameter uh, based on they'll get a higher tds on the same procedure that they are doing but this that's assuming that the people are not kind of uh, measuring tds and and adapting to your new profile so so that's a lot of assumptions here um so but I, I would, I would, I would uh, perhaps uh, just see it as a consequence, and then perhaps measure the TDS and just see, oh, this has a higher TDS. That might be why I prefer it. Good. We have one more question from Benjamin. Yeah. Okay, I'll read it out. I think a systematic approach is always what we are usually talking about. I guess most people usually just talk a couple of nuggets, take a couple of nuggets of information and dismiss all the context so I understand the assumption. My other question has to do with hardness. I recently have been paying more attention to green coffee hardness and taking note of rate of rise at first crack. I agree. A lot of people talk a lot about density, but I was wondering if you've been looking into hardness. Yeah, so strictly speaking, density is grams per liter, right? It's simply how many grams does each uh, liter uh, weigh? But it should also be uh, uh, correlated to hardness. 
So something is harder if it's more dense. Um, but that's, I, I, to be honest, I haven't been looking into this and this is something I think could be interesting to look into. But remember, just because I want to look into it, it would take a lot of time to even think about how to go about it. What is it that we want to explore? So it could be something like, one interesting thing to explore could be, is there a relationship if you have, and that's the problem, how would you get the same coffee at different densities, right? You would have to plant it at the bottom of a mountain, halfway up and then all the way on the top with the same rainfall, uh, you know, it's, it's so difficult because then, but even if that's possible, then you could uh, do the same roasting process. And then you can see if the lower density is more burned on the surface because of, of, of any being, energy being trapped on the surface and not conducted correctly uh, to, um, uh, to the center. So it, it's small, simple things like that that could be interesting, but it's, it's not really, or it could, you could simply take the same green coffee and then compress it. But then again, is hardness related to the way the tissue has grown so that the cells are harder, the cell structure is simply different. That's, it, it's so difficult to set up a, an experiment, but it, it's, it's worth doing. I, I, it could be interesting to, to, to nail this. Yeah, they are not as correlated as, as we would. Okay, could so Benjamin, could you could you send a link to that article because that I I really think that this is the next interesting. I think we've kind of mapped something really interesting out now in the roasting process itself. So I think it, the next step could be interesting. Uh, that could be interesting would be to to start to really be systematic about finding some relationship between greens and and, uh, and and roasting. And that's also what I noticed, Nikolai, the first uh, questions was of course all this, right? How does different beans react differently? And uh, I don't know if he lost a bit of respect that I couldn't answer them too well, uh, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but it's, but it, it's, it's, it's because if, uh, there's not a lot of work uh, done on this uh, that is really reliable or interestingly set up really. But Benjamin, do you have a link to, um, to, to, to that article? Just, uh, I just, the hardness of green coffee. Oh, that's Barista Hustle. But that's not a- ben, Benjamin says he, he'll send a, a link to you. But is Barista Hustle, that might, it's not a scientific piece of work, is it? Jonathan's or what? Uh, yeah. He, he's an astrophysics. Ah, uh, okay. Physicist. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, but, but yeah, but is it scientifically published? And the reason why I'm uh, asking no, no, I, is I that don't think that I don't think it's scientifically published. It's not peer reviewed or anything like that. And it, it's not to I, I, I don't know this guy. So but it's just uh, if you're not a food scientist, uh, it's, it's just I, I have 11 scientific publications by now. And the whole peer review process by food scientists is something where I have gotten something rejected or gotten feedback that I didn't think of that simply made my some assumptions I had uh, mm -hmm. kind of wrong, right? <laughs> so, so I, yeah. If it's not a if it's not a scientific article, it it might not be very well. Uh, kind of elaborated enough to be kind of relevant in, but I don't know. I don't know. Um, Good. I just have a few more quick ones, and then I think we need to wrap up. Otherwise, we're going to end up uh, spending uh, all night here. Um, so first of all, Morden, is there a difference between an espresso and a filter roast? 
Yeah, this this is where I would um, um, espresso and filter roasts are concepts in consumers' minds, right? So this is this is where, and Nikolai and I talked about this. I could take the lightest roasted filter coffee, make an espresso, and be the happiest guy, right? Um, the same for me. Yeah. Yeah. So so it it all depends on what is a espresso and what is a, a, a filter coffee in the minds of the consumers you have decided to uh, uh, to address basically so i would say no as a rule of thumb espressos are typically roasted darker than filter yeah but <laughs> that's just a rule of thumb right yeah good and if you were to summarize you know uh, how you get fruity versus a higher body uh, roasted coffee if you are thinking about it from a very much rule of thumb from a product development perspective yeah but then then this slide this is from our research uh, where where you can uh, you can see we we documented um we documented um, uh, how the different development time shifted the flavor so you can see the blue labels that's the different the fast one, the short development time, and longer and longer, and you can see that fruitiness, acidity, sweetness, and even a vague concept uh, that we introduced here, clean cup, <laughs> is higher in the fast uh, or short development time, and then it goes more chocolatey and nutty and roasty and bitter as you extend the development time, keeping the uh, um, the color the same. Yeah. I just Good. looked at the uh, the article and it it yeah it's not a scientific article but it looks pretty interesting and looks very well done so I'll definitely have a look on that one. Uh, Jonathan wrote a whole book on how to uh, how to brew uh, pour overs and the scientific process behind it so so he's 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 definitely very focused around uh, the data of uh, many elements of coffee. Yeah. Good. Um, you know, one thing which, you know, maybe also to do a little bit of advertisement for some of the stuff that you guys do um, and that I've been going through myself uh, is the sensory uh, sensory training program that you have, have developed. And I'm right now in the lucky position to be, be going through that right now. And, and basically the program is really yeah here's a picture of it right and i know that john who's on the call here as well he's also sitting and doing that right now i had to break off a few times because i had a cold and it's not so good to develop sensory capabilities when you have a cold but you know even though i'm just two weeks into the to the to the program then i i can really see that i have developed my you know i don't know if it's palette but it's simply my ability of being able to identify flavors uh, in, in in the right way so uh you know, if you can, if yeah, you that, can find the uh, find find the money for participating in something like that, then I think it's a really really nice little uh, project to do. Yeah, that's basically EDA's uh, uh, PhD program. So, so for eight years, we started eight years ago on this, and uh, we wanted to create an evidence based process for sensory learning, um, and uh, we turned it into a PhD program in the company. So it's an industrial PhD. And um, yeah, we started eight years ago and next week we'll get the first article out on that documents the effect of her training program. And since we've documented the effect, we've released it as an e-learning uh, program. So it's basically an e-learning um, uh, program where you'll get a, a kit shipped uh, in the mail. And uh, then every day there's something new to do. It could be basic taste, it could be aromas from uh, Centone, it, there's coffees in it, there's a lot of um, different things. So every day there's a small training, five to 10 minutes, and we have proven the uh, effect of the training program scientifically. So it's the only sensory uh, evidence-based uh, sensory training program out there. So the SCA is not, and the Q grader is all the opposite of scientific. So it's, it's actually pretty groundbreaking that, that we have got this out now. And uh, as you can see here, I, I, I did a webinar um, some days ago or last week where I created a, an offer bundle. 
basically you get a huge discount on all our digital products. And uh, once you've accepted that offer, you'll be taken to an upsell page where you can get um, the either sensory training kit for 200 euros rather than 250. Uh, so John and Nikolai, uh, close your, no, you also got it at discount, right? We got it at discount. <laughs> okay. Um, and so that's one optional upsell, but you can also jump on a, a live, uh, uh, seven hour live virtual roasting course with me, either on the bullet, uh, Ikawa or the stronghold. I don't have coffee, uh, cafe logic yet, but I'll, I'll fly down to Nikolai and then we can do one <laughs> in, in Dubai. from your kitchen. Yeah. yeah exactly. Um, so if you're interested in any of these, you can scan the code and, um, and you will be taken to the, to the funnel where you can make, um, um, uh, your decision. If you want to just go with this, uh, all our digital products, that's basically six hours of um of uh, a training four hours rose profile behind basics that's the control part of the our framework and then um either sensory basics is a, a small two hours uh, of just really uh, basic sensory training from a scientific point of view um so it's it's a lot of good stuff in just the uh, all the digital products and um my webmaster told me that we'll have some maintenance in one and a half hour, 10 o'clock Danish time. So uh, if you want to jump on this uh, um, offer, it would have to be within the next one and a half hour and we'll take down the, the funnel. Yeah, good. One one more thing. Uh, we have one more question from Justin. 6.30 on the Akawa was nice, but I saw that the start temperature was 120 degrees. How does that relate to the cafe logic time? Because the cafe logic, when we pour in the beans, it's at, you know, it's at, at room temperature, right? Um, uh, it it doesn't preheat the cafe logic. No, no, no. But it's I wouldn't worry too much about that because basically what happens in the beginning of the roast tend to start in the beginning of the roast. There's even the ikawa you will see there's thirty seconds of of kind of getting steady state uh, temperature. So I'm pretty sure it's very similar in the cafe logic that it will reach steady state within the first thirty seconds and whether it's preheated or not. I'm not sure it's that important in a small uh, air-based uh, system like that. It, it, should, um, it should reach steady state pretty quickly. Yeah. Good. So, Morten, I want to thank you. And of course, also, you know, the, the offer here, that's of course your, uh, if some of you decide to, uh, to, to go in on these, then it's the, it's the way we can pay for Morten's time to sit and spend time with here. Yeah, here. don't and, worry. Uh, and then um, you know, um, as I said, the, um, the the sensory science class. It's 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 first of all, I'm I'm quite surprised about the change in my uh, in my ability to un understand what I'm I'm drinking. Uh, it's just something as simple as learning how to taste. Uh, I figured out that often when I taste, I don't do it in the right way, and and Ida goes through that in the in the training as well. And you know, it, it also works on. On, on other stuff than coffee, right? It's, uh, it's the same when you have a beer or a, a glass of wine or whatever it might be, um, where you want to to uh, to understand some of the flavors. So, uh, so thanks for ruining beer for me, Mon. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and and then uh, apart from that, it's fun. It's it's really a, a fun little exercise to do. Um, so yeah, thank you very much, Morten. Um, thank you. I, I hope all of you guys like to to be be beyond the the call here and uh, and hear some of what what Morten is doing. And uh, we'll post the webinar online. There's a lot of people on the on the forum who couldn't be here because of time zones, and they asked whether they could be uh, uh, be allowed to to see the uh, see the, the the recording afterwards. So I hope we can we uh, we can uh, post that as well. And then uh, I think there's nothing left than but to say thank you. Great. Thank you very much for your time. Love talking about these things. So it's great. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.